when, when Steve asked me to do this presentation, I, I was a little worried because, as he mentioned, uh, it literally was, you know, I looked at my CFO that day after we saw his presentation, we came back, and we said, okay, let's just stop. And so, you know, now I got to figure out how to fill 40 minutes with, well, we just stopped. And uh, so I'll give you a little bit of the background of where the company was, how it was evolving, and then a couple of the things that we discovered after we just stopped that were, were interesting. Um, a little bit about myself, I, and I'm going to have to hold myself here, I understand, because I'm used to all over. But um, it, it, it's sort of creeping me out that I've been out of school for 30 years now. Um, I've got a degree in chemical engineering from Rensselaer, did some co-op work. You saw Nestle. I didn't get to do the glamorous stuff. No chocolate bars. I made bouillon cubes for a little while. Um, auto headlights with Sylvania. About 10 years at Abbott down here in the Bay Area, down in Mountain View and Morgan Hill. Um, jumped. Uh, I, I got tired of medical devices at, uh, in about 2000 and jumped and did uh, telecom photonic equipment. And uh, any of you that knew what happened in 2000 know that was the exact wrong time to jump into telecom equipment. And it, we had an 18-month backlog. 12 months later, we were shutting down the facility on September 10th, 2001. So it was an interesting week. Uh, started and eventually sold to our one customer, a, a little, a very tiny uh, contract manufacturer when we got tired of paying everyone else except ourselves. Uh, did a little bit of consulting, and that's when, in 2004, I joined uh, Specialty Silicone down in Paso, which is very close. I live in Morro Bay, so it's very close by. And I'll give you a little bit more about that company in a second. Stayed there for about eight years and left in the uh, uh, end of 2012 when a couple of partners and I had Gimba Academy going for a couple of years. And uh, I spend most of my time between that now and, and Slow Seed Ventures, which is a uh, a teeny tiny little angel investment group on the, uh, the central coast of California. So a little bit about Gimba Academy for the, the mandatory 15 second plug. Um, we are the videographer uh, sponsor for the event. When we started five years ago, we, our goal was to find a way to deliver lean training to what we thought were small manufacturers that couldn't afford uh, traditional consultants and sending people out to training, let alone having an in-house trainer. And over five years, it's, it's become radically different. Uh, most of our customers are not in manufacturing, and most of our cu customers are very large, and they want a way to speak a common lean language across 50, 100 plants. And so that's why you see some of those names on there. So it's been very interesting, over 600 videos now, 2,000 organizations using it worldwide. So my first lean experience, though, and I didn't know it at the time, was right out of school. and, and uh, 85, I was a development engineer for Sylvania. Uh, we were developing the, the first interchangeable auto headlight. Up until then, for those of you that are as old as I am, they're all sealed beams. And so you had a choice of maybe two contours, and that's where we saw all the cars that had the same front end on them. And we had developed this, this uh, snap-in replaceable headlamp. And uh, uh, the, there are three of us that have the patent on that, long since expired. We got the buck to put on the wall to prove it. Um, and uh, we, we were making these things uh, by the gazillion for the big three in the U.S. Uh, and then back in, in the 80s, a new auto manufacturer is part, starting to show up called Toyota. You didn't hear much about them in the U.S. at that point. But we finally got a contract and sent 100,000 lamps over to them. And about three weeks later, they called up my boss complaining about a huge quality problem and called several people over there. Not me. I didn't get to go. But as he tells the story, um, they're sitting around a conference room table with five of those lamps on the table talking about the defects. They spent the day going through it. They figured out it was a welding issue. And as they were leaving, my boss said, can you send us the rest of them so that we can do some more analysis? And Toyota looked at him a little strangely and said, no, those are them. You know, five out of 100,000, uh, which is Six Sigma quality, coincidentally. But it was about 1 30th the defect rate that we had been very comfortable with until that point. So that was when there's a lot, of, a lot of things had to change after that. But that was the first experience. Fast forward about 20 years through all the other things, and I joined Specialty Silicon when I was consulting there, and the president of the company was about to retire, and you know we made some arrangements there. And, and there, Specialty Silicon was one of about three companies at the time that did all the processing of silicone in all kinds of different ways for medical devices primarily. So molding, extrusion dipping and sheeting, 
And their claim to fame was an extrusion technology that lets you change the interior geometry of the extruded part on the fly. So you could go from one lumen to three lumens to seven lumens back to one. You could change the wall thickness so you could have integrated balloons um, without gluing them on like catheters usually are. Uh, you could change the material to go from softer to harder durometer. Very interesting technology, still exists today. There are a couple of other people that do it now. Um, but back then, that's what was the claim to fame. That's what made all the money. The problem was in 2004, 2005, that there are other competitors starting to come on the market. And so we knew that something had to change. We had to get better in the face of that competition. And that's when we began our lean journey. And that lean journey over eight years, and I'll come back to a little bit of the detail, but went very well. You know, over those eight years, we dropped our cycle time from 35 days to five days. We could have dropped it to one, but there's no customer value in that. Um, did, did very well um, to the extent that we were supplying low cost manufacturers, the low cost assembly operations in Asia from our plant in California and doing it competitively. So of, of all the places to manufacture, California is supposed to be one of the worst. We had no problem even competing with low cost Asian producers from California. We had several of our customers, uh, large medical device companies that had set up facilities in China and India and Vietnam to manufacture their devices and wanted us to set up a plant over there to supply it, thinking that's how you do things. And it was difficult telling them that, you know, I can airship from California and get it there and be cheaper than the, our competitor that is already over there. So this, this worked out so well that about 2010, we built a new 120,000 square foot facility in California when other states were offering to build it for us. And the reason for that, and this ties in with Doug's presentation right before me, is that we realized the power of people. And we knew that if we moved, we'd lose the people, and that those people were worth far more than what their cost shows up on a balance sheet. The problem is to get there through our lean transformation, we went through what we call the tool head era. And those of you that have done lean know that you can quickly get sucked into the, the world of 5S and value stream mapping and TPM. And we got so crazy at one point that we even had a goal to do two tools a year, regardless of what they are. We were just going to, you know, by hell or high water, we we're going to do two tools a year. And we did that actually for a couple of rather insane years until someone on my staff asked a very pertinent question of, you know, why are we doing any of this? And that sort of uh, knocked us between the eyes and we stopped and we took a step back and we tried to figure out what we were about. You know, why are we doing 5S? Why are we doing TPM? What are the results we expect? And, and that was very valuable for us. And over the course of the next year, we, we looked and developed our own strategy, what we wanted to be. And we developed this business system. And I'm not going to go through it in too much detail, but basically we assessed where we are. We assessed our strategic environment. We developed a strategy based on that. We deployed that strategy using a Hoshin plan and then uh, developed accountability systems. The main one that works the best is just a daily stand-up meeting where you all get there and you align. You start it on the, on the shop floor. It rolls up to the executive staff. We had three plants. We had a video conference every morning at 8.30 and we went over this and we made sure everyone is aligned. Uh, we executed, we reviewed, uh, and, and we spun around in that loop. And that was, so our strategy was continually evolving, continually being modified. And you'll see that I, I X'd out vision and mission because we struggled with that and finally gave up. Finally decided that you know, for, mo for the most part, you know, who could really describe the difference between a vision and mission? You, you read some crazy things, like there's one in Harvard Business Review just two weeks ago of, you know, try to put your vision down in 15 words, you know, for whatever good that does. I don't know the value in that. So you end up at a point where your vision is either so wide and so vague that it doesn't do anything for you or so narrow that it constrains you. So we just got rid of it. And, uh, and we developed a set of principles uh, instead based on lean activities such as, you know, create value from the perspective of the customer, respe respect for people, and continuous improvement. And then we just fed that into that loop and just kept on going around, assessing, executing, reviewing, and assessing. Whatever it takes. We, and, yes. 
Yes, and actually the review, and we had, I'll show you in a second, the quarterly review we went through. But we developed a Hoshin plan, which becomes very powerful. Your long-term strategies, your three-year objectives tied to that, your annual goals tied to that, and then your daily activities. And so for a, a company like Specialty Silicon, with silicone in our name, the big fear we always had was, what if someone developed a alternative to silicone? What would happen? And you know, that, that can be a pretty scary thing. So just as an example, one of our long-term strategies was find an alternative to silicone and, and build a business off of that. We then had three-year objectives to have a certain percentage of the business come from a different biomaterial, and then annual goals each year of uh, find one, find a way to get into it, whether it's organic or acquisition, and then how to grow it. Uh, so this became very critical to how we move forward. And the most critical part of that was we then took all of our projects and all of the thing, our activities and mapped them against that, that Hoshin plan. And anything that wasn't aligned, we stopped. There were some things that we decided as a group to continue to do because you always need to be trying new things and pushing the boundaries. But we stopped a vast number of projects, some of which we didn't even know were being worked on, and that freed up a tremendous amount of time. And I mentioned the, the quarterly review, and this, we're in the middle of wine country, our main plant in Paso. So J. Laura Winery is a half mile up the road, so once a quarter, I'd get my, that, is, that was my executive staff, and we'd go up there, we'd nominate a scribe, so someone at least recorded and could remember what we talked about. Um, and we had good conversations in the, in the morning, and in the afternoon we had even better conversations that we don't remember very much of. Um, and then we somehow make our way back to the plant. But that, that was very viable because we had challenged ourselves in, uh, you know, is the strategy working? What do we need to be doing? And most importantly, and what ties into this, is what shouldn't we be doing? And we started coming up with lists of all kinds of things of, you know, we're doing this activity, but why are we really doing it? What value does it create you know, for us, let alone for the customer? And, and that's where we start to look at our accounting systems. We came up with this, that, uh, this concept that our largest cost was not the traditional buckets of labor, material, and overhead. It was unnecessary complexity. And when you start looking at it from that perspective, things look a little bit differently. You're no longer focused on how can I reduce labor, it's how can I reduce the, the complexity of the system that is creating the need for additional labor. Um, automation only hides complexity, something we believed in. I, I took a, a, a tour of Japan in 2009, I believe it was, where we visited several factories. And one of them was Toyota in Kyushu, which was, at the time, their most efficient auto manufacturing facility. They would make the Lexus sedans, the, uh, the, the Highlander hybrids, and so forth one at a time, completely random order, there's not a computer on the factory floor. Not a, it's all manual Kanban. There's no automation except for when there's a safety issue, for example, the galvanizing tanks or that kind of thing. And what they had discovered was by the power of employee ideas, and they did a very good job of this, all the employee ideas would create a three to 5% productivity increase per year. And the story they would tell is one of their suppliers set up a lights out factory next to them, completely full of robots, and they were all human on this side. And one of them was more efficient to begin with, but in 10 years, what happened? One of them was in the exact same place it was when it started, and Toyota had moved forward. So that, that changed a lot of how I look at people, and the people side is what actually started us looking at our accounting systems. So there, there are two pillars of lean that, that we look at. Increased value from the perspective of the customer. Everyone knows, everyone on a lean journey knows that very well. Respect for people you hear quite a bit. I don't know how many people really understand what that means. Uh, uh, Doug, that presented before me, I was happy to see that that was the top thing on his list when he talked about lean. And it really is the most powerful concept. And it's not just paying respect, it's enabling people by giving them the learning tools they need supporting them with ideas, finding ways to use those ideas. And that's what most companies don't get. They don't, every failed lean transformation I've seen, it's failed because they haven't grasped that concept. And that's also why several of us in the lean community push back on combining lean and Six Sigma. They're both very good concepts. They both work very well. When you combine them, you take a subset of lean and a subset of Six Sigma, and you combine them, 
And every single time I've seen that, the subset of lean does not include anything on the respect for people side. It just becomes tool-based lean. In a diatribe on Lean Six Sigma, but you know where I stand now. So getting back to the accounting side, this, when we were looking at respect for people, we started to look at our financial statements, and we realized you know, that the, the cost of people is on there. It's on the P&L, it's on the balance sheet. It, it, it's very easy to discern. That's, that's traditional cost accounting. But where is the brain? The, the, nowhere on a P&L or a balance sheet is the value of the person accounted for. There's no offsetting value to the cost of people. And this really started to bother us because we were being, luckily we were private, so we didn't have to uh, deal with a lot of shareholders, but we, we were, how do we present what we're doing uh, when there's so much value in the, in the brain? And, this, and it's because of that, of not having an offsetting value on, on a balance sheet, why companies make some crazy decisions. Like, you know, you've heard of them that, you know, they'll, they'll lay off, you know, a thousand people with 20 years of experience to go somewhere for $2 cheaper labor, not realizing what they've given them up. And some of them, as, as you know, GE's moved their appliance manufacturing back, Whirlpool laid off a bunch, moved to Mexico, and is now moving back. They've started to see what they've lost. Um, but still, that's a very hard, you know, when you're looking at your P&L and your financial picture is judged by your P&L, how, you, how do you look at that? So that bothered us and got us to thinking, you know, gee, you, we need to start looking at our accounting systems overall. Um, and one, one last, just because I always like putting the slide up, I, as one of my, you know, I, I, I love that show. Um, but something that I, I talked to the owners of my company about a lot, and, and it just it, it aggravated them, was who in a company has the most financial clout? Yeah, and you think of a small to medium-sized company, you know, a president might be able to sign for 50,000 without having to take it to a board. Meanwhile, you've got a, you've got a QC inspector on the floor that can look at a batch of material and go, no, it looks bad, and $100,000 just went out the door. Yeah. So where, who, where is the accountability for who has how much financial control in a company? It just seemed odd. So we were pu pushing at a lot of these concepts. Um, Peter Drucker said, there's nothing so useless as doing efficiently that which should not be done at all. And we felt that our accounting systems and our, our system of budgeting was done very well, but what was it buying us? Um, you know, like a lot of companies that had traditional budgets, you know, we would, we would you know, go through this huge exercise in September, October, November to create this budget. You know, the managers would kid themselves that their, their people are doing a really good job of trying to figure out where their budget should be, when in reality they're looking at last year's numbers going, yeah, this looks about right. And, and then at the end of the year, they'd set it, and then we'd spend the entire rest of the year having all kinds of meetings with all kinds of people analyzing why we're not doing what we thought we were going to do from our crystal ball a year ago. And it, it's, it's crazy. Uh, at the same time, as we were already getting our Hoshin plan in place with that review, so our strategy would be able to evolve on an ongoing basis, where a company was headed would be doing this kind of a thing, but our budgets would start to constrain us to going straight. And so it was impacting how we actually executed our, our uh, strategic plan. So we stopped. Basically, as Steve mentioned, uh, my CFO and I went to the uh, Lean Accounting Summit in 2007. And uh, we, we heard several presentations, actually, that changed how we did things on how to do a uh, P&L, plain English P&Ls, value stream P&Ls, so on and so forth. And then Steve's presentation on, you know, why are you doing this crazy budgeting stuff? And we just sort of looked at each other going, yeah, well, that makes sense. And on the plane back, you know, he wrote an email and saying, as of tomorrow, stop. And that was it. Um, you know, some of the accountants were a little jittery for a little bit, um, probably more for job security than anything. Um, but we really did just stop. And uh, it doesn't mean we stopped all financial analysis, though. Um, and, and so doing it that way, just stopping, you know, it looked like a good idea at the time. You know, and I tried to find some good examples of things that I thought were good ideas at the time, but who knows how they'll end up, you know. Um, and we ran into some issues. So whether we would do it again that way and so suddenly, I actually think we would. But uh, uh, because if you, if you go through the process, like a lot of companies, of analyzing your budgets and easing away from it, you know, do you really actually ever get there? 
Um, and that's uh, the uh, forum that Steve was alluding to. You know, that was my point there. Of, you know, everyone was asking, how do you go about doing it? And I'm like, you just have to just do it. And get, you know, it's, it's a lot easier in a smaller company with a very you know, open-minded and willing CFO than most. I'll, I'll grant you that. We still do a lot of uh, financial analysis. You know, we, did, uh, uh, we have a value stream P&L, and we, would, uh, we, we had been well on the path of reorganizing into value streams. We had deconstructed our functional silos. So we had, for example, a molding value stream that had manufacturing and quality and engineering all inside of it, and a couple of other groups matrixed into it. Um, and so we were on our way to doing that. Uh, cash flow forecasting in a smaller company, you've got to do that. You've got to know where your cash is coming from. Sales trending. And then we would look at our spending versus the previous year, but not in trying to say, you know, gee, I'm spending more on pins this year than last year. More just, am I not spending 10 times as many? You know, just for orders of magnitude to see if there's something wrong. And how we ended up making decisions is we became very good at making the best decision at the time with the best data that we had available. So if in June I decided, you know, we need to buy another extruder, we would look at, do we have the cash? Do we expect to have the cash? What is the market opportunity? Um, how would we support it? What is the timing? All those things that you typically go through on a decision. The, the difference is, is when you do budgeting, you know, you've done it again. You know, who, you, we would have done it the previous year if my crystal ball had said, I needed an extruder in June of the following year. I would have gone through that same analysis. But aside from perhaps some parts of the government, where do you have a budget, you know, especially for, say, 100000 bucks, and you get to just miraculously spend that if it's in the budget? You go through the same justification all over again. So why not just do it once? And that's what we did. Something we realized, though, is that as we were looking at, you know, why weren't, in hindsight, why didn't our strategy follow our budget in the past, is we found that some managers were better at negotiating budgets than others. Um, and whether it's they put more time into it, they just had the persona, who knows. And that actually skewed the strategies that we were trying to put into place, because there'd be more money. You know, we may say that our strategy is going in this direction. If someone has a budget with more money over on this direction, it's going to start pulling your strategy over into that direction. And so by eliminating budgeting, we, we leveled out the playing field. Now we, we, we had to come together, we had to discuss major, you know, major expenditures and just do the right thing at the right time. Another uh, a quote from Deming, management by a numerical goal is an attempt to manage without knowing what to do. Um, I see this in a lot of companies that you have the budget, you have the sales budget, you have the target, and full steam ahead, regardless of whether that is the right direction, let alone have you been able to change direction after a couple of months and another couple of months and another couple of months. So by eliminating budgeting, you can just stay focused on your strategy. You don't have to look backwards. You can just stay focused forwards on making sure that strategy is in place. Another interesting thing we discovered along the way is uh, we, were, we, we had reorganized into value streams and uh, we had our four or five value streams, but the budgeting process tried to pull us back into functional silos. You know, the, the budgeting process wanted to know, you know how much are we spending on quality, not how much is quality as a component of X value stream, but overall just quality. And the same thing would happen in engineering and some other overhead type functions. And so the budgeting process itself just kept on dragging us back from doing a, a true value stream organization. When we got rid of budgeting, that all went away. We could then just focus on our value stream P&L and be done with it. I mentioned there is an issue and, and, and one issue that we came up with uh, or that sort of hit us after two years of no budgets was uh, that budgeting we discovered is how, in a lot of companies, people learn the financials of how a company works. You know, a new manager, a new supervisor, an engineer, it's their budgeting experience where they get to say, oh, I only have this amount of money. Gee, what am I going to do with it? How do I deploy that? Uh, how do I get more money later in the year? And they, they start to understand the financial underpinnings of a company. And we were losing that after a couple of years. 
and we discovered that some of our newer employees and even some people on my staff, they, their, their financial acumen uh, was deteriorating. So we, we did what, what seemed logical, and we sent people to remedial financial training, um, which, you know, in hindsight, that was not, probably not the best idea because uh, that's probably how it looked, you know, at least how it would if I did it. Um, but, but since then, they have found ways of, you know, one uh, is that as a private company, we, we held the P&L very close to our vest. We, we opened that up a lot, and we, we shared a lot more of that information um, so that everyone could see here are sales, here's how we're doing. You know, there, there are some things you still leave off, but you know, overall, here's where our costs are going and so forth. And that helped build that back up. And we had to invest in, in some ongoing training as well. I had a, uh, uh, a project for everyone on my staff that if they ever identified a gap, I would pay for their training. And most of them identified small gaps. We, they would go to local classes, that kind of thing. The guy that, that would become my successor was a little bit more brash. And he's like, I have identified. I, I don't have the level of financial knowledge I need to know. And I've, I, I found a class. So he convinced me to, to send him to Wharton for two weeks, um, which is no small expense for a smaller company. <laughs> um, in fact, that paid for many of our reviews. You know, we were trying to, you know, that kind of a thing. Um, but so he was there, you know, at, at Wharton, the, you know, the bastion of, traditional hardcore financial management, uh, sitting alongside VPs of Ford and so forth, and the topic of budgeting came up. And um, he had the guts. He raised his hand and just asked why. And, and you can imagine the looks he got when that happened. Um, people looked at him just, uh, just a little bit strangely. Um, you know, who knows what that did to the reputation of the company. Um, but uh, anyway, but, but good for him. You know, it, it, is, it is something new. Yeah, you know, and the, the key thing is to always ask why. So I guess the, the summary is that the things that budgeting, eliminating budgeting did for us is just allowing us to focus forward. That was probably the biggest thing. You, we no longer, sure we saved some time because people were no longer looking backwards. They were no longer spending hours a month analyzing why they spent too much on copier paper and then having to justify why they spent too much on copier paper. You know, they were looking forward and making sure the strategy executed very well. The enable change from silos to value streams helped us out a lot, freed up some resources, and then we were always just focused on simplification. And the only caveat I would give is just watch out for the financial management. And then the thing that we really pushed in our company a lot, um, to the point of being annoying sometimes if you're a manager, is just teaching everyone to always ask why. Yeah, always ask why. So, any questions? Sure. We, we had, uh, oh, it ranged up to about 400 across three sites. We had a facility in Central, the, the Central Coast was the, the largest facility. We had one in LA and one in Northern Michigan. And how many Yeah, a couple hundred. Yeah. Sure. Any more? Um, because I could initially, you know, when I came in, um, the, uh, you know, it, it's always a battle between, there's often a battle between the president and the CFO of a company on, on how you do things. And so I basically, you know, over the course of a few years had to win him over to uh, what lean can do. And, and most companies go through this. They'll, they'll go through, you know, some of the tools. There's always, you know, low hanging fruit that you can do. You can do the, the value stream organization on your own. And it's only you know, after a few years that, that the financial impacts really start to become a barrier. Um, you know, it's a little bit easier for us as a contract manufacturer because we didn't have inventory to begin with. We built it, we shipped it. So you didn't have some of the classic things of you know, valuing inventory as an asset instead of a liability. Um, but still, it took time to get to the point where we could do that. Oh, uh, pretty much the fact that we didn't do it. Yeah, we, we did very, 
very little true strategic planning before we started the ocean planning. If we had a demand, we hired people. Uh, I, I would say it's almost that simple. You know, we would we'd go through some discussion of it. You know, is this a solid demand? Is it going to stay? You go through the rationalization of should I handle this on overtime for a while or should I actually hire people? Um, we looked at shifts and, and how we accommodate that, which in California is a neat trick, as you know. Um, of you know, do we stay with you know five eights? Do we go to you know nine eighties and so forth? You know, what is the best way of handling it, knowing the capabilities of some of our equipment that likes to just run? Um, but um, for the most part, you know, we, you know, I, I wouldn't know how you would forecast people, in fact. I would, you know, our, the other aspect of our business that may be a little bit different is since it is contract manufacturing, it's very difficult to know what is really out there. You know, we have, like anyone would have, we have larger customers that have their own forecasts that we can tie on to. But... Um, without having our own captured product, it, we didn't have that kind of market intelligence sometimes. You could, you could hire people next week if you had Yeah, work. yeah. Okay. So you, it wasn't like a long-term... No, no, no. No. No, yeah, in, that, in that area, in the Central Coast, it is harder to get some higher-level technical resources. Uh, but assembly resources are, are much easier. Go, go ahead. So, um, <laughs> I'll, I'll get you. We didn't have to convince the board. Uh, if if the CFO and I agreed, it, it, it happened. But it, it was a small company, and you know, the, the boards of small companies are a little bit different than the boards of bigger companies. That they're you know they're usually people you see every day anyway. Right. What was the time horizon you guys were trying to keep in, uh, projections? Uh, well, the, the, the sales projections we'd keep, you know, they're, they're pretty much still on a calendar basis. Uh, we were starting to move that to just going forward four quarters. But in our business, again, as a contract manufacturer, that fourth quarter out, you would have very little confidence. So really, what was the value of that uh, aside from did it go off a cliff? Um, so we, we didn't do too much. Right now, you know, in, in talking to my predecessor, they, they are going, uh, they're trying to find a, a more intermediate ground to do some better planning and are looking more at quarter by quarter, you know, rolling type budgeting, you know, staying away from a, a calendar year type of concept. So. There's, a, there's a framework, and this, this is something I, I was tempted to put in here, but haven't really thought through enough. Budgeting creates a decision-making framework as well. And when you get rid of it, especially if you do it as suddenly as we did, sometimes that goes away and that can be detrimental. You, know, if you need to have you know, uh, you know, how people make decisions. They make it inside this box. Uh, financial is part of that box. And uh, you, know, you may need to find some other systems to put into place there. The other KPIs that we had, and, and it's typical for a, a lean manufacturing company of, of cycle time, uh, you know, first pass yields, that type of thing. You know, they, they all improved. I, whether they changed with the, when we got rid of budgets, I don't really think so. I think those were always there. You know, and then uh, at the executive level, before we started sharing a little bit more of this information, we would look at you know, obviously cash balance and cash flow and. And you know AR and you know how your receivables are looking and so forth. Good. All right. Thank you.